Joseph Farrell is an Oxford-educated historian who specializes in World War II and secret technologies, as well as being an expert in patristics, i.e. early church history. He's the founder of the popular website Giza Death Star, and I'm glad to have him as my guest today. Uh, thank you for coming on, Joseph. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I reached out to you because I had a question regarding um, the current hostilities that were taking place in the Middle East, and I noticed that they were happening almost 50 years to the day of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, and I had read a book um, by uh, William Engdahl, and it was entitled A Century uh -huh. of War. And he talks about kind of the role of petroleum in all these wars and how uh, in 1973, 50 years ago, so this is the anniversary, uh, the seven sisters, the seven largest oil companies got together at the Bilderberg Group and they were kind of, you know, wargaming. How do we increase profits? And the solution was to strangle off supply. And their goal was mm -hmm. to quadruple uh, profits. And it actually quintupled. Uh, Henry Kissinger was sent out to the Middle East. He kind of, yep. you know, rigged this this ho these hostilities between Israel and their Arab neighbors, and oil supplies were choked off. We go into stagflation in the seventies. We end up with compact oh. cars. And my thoughts about this were, you know, if this is a redo of of exactly that, this might be a way to channel us toward electric cars as they make energy mm -hmm. so cost prohibitive. And uh, you said that there might be something actually deeper going on than simply oil profits. And I, I just kind of well. I, I think there may be, but I do think that, you know, the way, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I think the uh, power elite of the world, particularly in the West, likes to do things, is that they like to stack functions. Mm -hmm. So I I I certainly think energy and, and oil and all of that is involved in this current uh, situation we know that there is a large reserve right off the coast of israel and right off the coast of the gaza strip yeah. we know that there are large nat natural gas reserves there so from one point of view if you're going to exploit that that reserve of natural gas and energy one or the other side in the way that the elites think has to control it the reason yeah. I just wanted to use that as a, as a jumping off point, uh, okay. because I wanted to hit the topic of the, the like the fact that it happened almost 50 years to the day. Uh, uh -huh. I think it was October 6th, uh, it, you know, in 1973, it happened. And then right. it, it's October 7th here. But right. given time zone differences, problems, you know, within a couple of hours of a 50 year, right. uh, you know, anniversary. Exactly. And I wanted to start with your book, uh, Babylon Bank, Babylon's Banksters. Because mm -hmm. you talk about something that fascinated me, and it was the foundation for the study of cycles. And oh, yeah. uh, there, there are many <laughs> cycles that happen. And uh, you know, can you can you kind of speak to that Herbert Hoover and the the foundation of the well, study of cycles? yeah, President Hoover. You know, God bless him. I mean, he's president when the Great Depression hits, and he politically he's never able to recover, particularly with with. Uh, Franklin Delano Commivelt and his, as I like to nickname him, and his political campaign in 1932, which of course blamed everything on Herbert Hoover, <laughs> you know. And the the idea was created that Hoover did nothing to alleviate the depression. What, which is not true. What Hoover actually did was something very interesting. He called in a man from the Treasury Department by the name of Edward Dewey. And Hoover assigned this man a, the task of finding out why it was that regardless of what government policies were or what governments tried to do, there were always these cycles of boom and bust. And Hoover assigned this guy to go dig and find out, you know, is this just something that we have to live with? What you know, go find out what's causing this to happen over and over again. So Dewey, in turn, being in the Treasury Department and the Commerce Department, had access to an immense database. And he began to compile data on virtually every kind of cycle, uh, Daniel, that you can think of. 
steel production, pig iron, corn production, maple syrup, you know, you name it, he investigated it. And he started noticing that in all of these individual commodities, housing, construction, you know, you name it, in each one of the areas that he was investigating, there were these long cycles that were recurrent. And when he investigated different things together, you know, when he when he attempted to modulate the waveform from all of these different cycles, he discovered that there were yet other cycles. Mm-hmm. And he he began to be fascinated by this, and he he founded a foundation called the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. Incidentally, it's still in existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think the it's based in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. And the interesting thing, when you look at the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, they still publish their uh, yearbooks and newsletters, and you know they're full of graphs and charts and of all of these very long wave cycles um interestingly enough when you look at the membership of these things you'll find banks like mitsubishi bank is is a member of the foundation for the study of cycles well i mean that's not that's not shocking at all because uh look look at in the ancient world right i mean the difference between like a savage and a civilized man like thales of miletus he, yeah. he, he like a civilized man he uses systematic thought and he notices right. hey these eclipses are happening in cycles right, right? they're right. not happening because of the anger of the gods and right. and so that that you know so so the the cultivated mind that is a sign of cult uh, herbert spencer says that in 1873 right. in the study of sociology that the the cultivated mind sees patterns and right. the savage the stupid person just these sees reality as a random you know series of right. so bankers love cycles you know well the interesting thing about about the foundation for the study of cycles is that Mm -hmm. Dewey, after studying all of these things, published a little book. Uh, And as all of this is happening, of course, he's making his reports to president Hoover. Uh, Roosevelt, I think just jettisons him. I, it's an interesting part of the story that's not talked about, but uh, Hoover listened and Roosevelt didn't basically. But the interesting thing that Dewey came to conclude was that these cycles of economic activity are somehow inherent and natural to the way things work, and that no amount of policy by central banks or governments can change or alter them. The only thing that policy can do is it can either strengthen or or mitigate the part of the cycle that you're in, but it cannot ever stop the cycle or arrest it completely. It can't get rid of the cycle. Yeah, it, 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 you, you mentioned trends, right? So there's the right. larger cycle, and then right. anything that goes above or below that line is a trend. So we can it's kind of tweak the trends around the you edges. You can tweak the trend, But right. you can't stop the wave, you the can. tsunami from coming right. down. Um, and uh, one of the things, too, that that, that part of your book uh, reminded me of was I'm, I'm a big uh, kind of fan of cybernetics, right? And right. I'm friends with uh, Paul Pangaro, who is uh, mm-hmm. kind of president of the American Society for Cybernetics. And uh, there's a cyber, cyber cybernetician named Stafford Beer, who back in the 70s, he did work in Chile and did all all sorts of interesting stuff. And so cybernetics is the study of like how you control a system with positive inputs and negative inputs. And we use that in computers with ones and zeros, you know, and and you can steer a system by using these positive. And he talked about, Stafford Beer talked about how society would go through oscillations, just like waveforms, right? Would go through oscillations and kind of sputter and and fall apart if, if change was happening too quickly and there was mm-hmm. a futurist in in the 70s called uh, alvin toffler who, who had a, a concept called future shock and mm-hmm. my question in reading this that. was if you're a student of a, of a particular civilization's waveform of its patterns and then you take another civilization let's call the call this a clash of civilizations right say right. you have islam and that's, say you have christendom right and they have two mm-hmm. different waveforms and you kind of bring them together could you theoretically cancel out you have a cancel you cancel out the wave of of you know by by kind of putting these waveforms over top of each other and you collapse a civilization. I was just I was just curious about your thoughts about that. Well, from a from a purely physics point of view, yes. In other words, if 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 you're representing a civilization by a waveform, 
then the way you jam the signal is to produce a wave that is 180 degrees out of phase with it. Mm. In other words, you're producing kind of a mirror image and reversal of it. So yeah. you talked about Dr. Lee Gaussian's cupula formula for manipulating society via cycles. So is that yeah, you, you, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you, from from that standpoint, yeah, you 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 would create a, a mirror image that's 180 degree out of phase. Now, interestingly enough, um, I think you could make that kind of case for Islam as a political ideology. Yeah, uh, because it's it's to a certain extent 180 degrees out of phase with with uh, Judaism and Christianity both at the same time. I think it. I think it more strongly resembles Judaism in so that I. sense than it does Christianity. But yeah, if you if you if you bring that kind of Edward Dewey detail to studies of cycles, then are you going to get civilization types that that modulate the waveforms of other types of cycles? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Look at Attila, uh, like attacking the Roman Empire. Right. That would be another right. example. Or in the late Bronze Age collapse with the people right. of the sea coming into Egypt. And so you have different waveforms coming in sure. and then you get collapse right afterwards. With sure, the, yeah. You know, Could that happen? Yeah. Could that happen? <laughs> Absolutely. If you had a, this is where it gets very fascinating. If you had a sufficiently advanced social science, you would be able to make correlations between aggregate human behavior and other types of physical system. Now, the classical name for that is astrology. It's funny that you say that, because I was about to say sociology. Herbert Spencer talks about exactly that study <laughs> And so, yeah. So the earlier manifestation is astrology. But go ahead, take that away. Well, well, let's let's go with that because if you look at the earliest Egyptian and Sumerian manuscripts and what they say about astrology, it's very interesting. Both of them will tell you that these these astrological predictive tables were based on observations made over tens of thousands of years. So the first thing they're telling you is it's an empirical science. Mm -hmm. The second thing that they do, those early astrologers do, is they make predictions for kings. That's key. Because what that's telling you is you can forget about the little sun sign booklets in the grocery store. <laughs> okay. Because what they're doing when they're casting a horoscope for a king is they're doing what a modern astrologer would call a mundane horoscope. In other words, they're doing a horoscope for an aggregate group of people. They are not doing a horoscope for an individual. It's a statistical thing they're talking about, in other words. An individual may or may not fall within the pattern. So in other words... They're telling you that the basis for astrology was rather similar to quantum mechanics. We're going to take a statistical average of the behavior of all these particles and make a prediction on how most of them are going to uh, behave under a certain given set of physical circumstances. Yeah, you That's can't predict the placement of one electron, but you right. can give a probability for the cluster, the average exactly. of electrons. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And that, that's what sociology was. Herbert Spencer talks exactly. about that. He, he talks about like uh, we we he says at the beginning of study sociology, he says that we're trained to look at, you know, history wrong. We're trained to look at it in terms of individuals. Uh, Rome was Julius Caesar. You know, America was, you know, right. George Washington. France right. was Napoleon. And he said, no, he said the only true way to understand a society is to understand its institutions, to understand right. not the, not an individual personality, but understand the aggregate of behavior. The aggregate and of that's, behavior. that's where you get cycles cycles right. happen in the aggregate and and right. he said something interesting too he said um in there that uh for instance the, the, the an individual unit might be you know chang li you know in, in china he's an individual unit just one guy 
Um, right. at, but a bunch of Chang Li's together becomes an aggregate that we call right. China, right? right? So, so, and he said that the aggregate o- o- often takes on the the characteristics of the individual units and vice right. versa. So, if you take like a single Englishman and you uh, Robinson Robinson Crusoe, take a single Englishman, you put him on a desert island, he will begin to recreate his society like right. like a fractal. Like a fract- right. fractal self-similarity. You take one piece of a polyp off and chop it off. It will regrow an identical yep. polyp. And so it's just interesting looking at that. But yeah, so this takes place. I, I, this is what I wanted to hit with you. Um, you know, like Herbert Spencer, he talks about in the 19th century, the, the concept of prevision, which we call today forecasting, right? Mm-hmm. And he said prevision, he said science has to have prevision, which means it's an algorithm. If you have a law, it has to be an algorithm. So, so if you understand how something happened in the past and you understand how something happened in the present, and if your algorithm is correct, it will give you a certain amount of certainty for a future forecast. And if you hit those forecasts, then you know that you have the algorithm the more or less correct, whether it's, you know, a Newtonian physics, you know, a thermodynamics right. or whatever. But one, this is one of the reasons why climate science uh, fails and, and is essentially a pseudoscience because their predictions are wrong. So was Manhattan underwater by the year 2000, as they were saying in the 80s? No, it was not. <laughs> yeah, I remember Which means that. that if their forecasts were wrong, it means their algorithm was wrong. If they, if they can't tell you what happened in the future, and this is why, like you get, like you were talking about those astrologers today, that would be a forecaster like Alvin Toffler, you know, the futurist, right. they would be called future. Right. today and they would right. like you to talk to heads of state you know about these these cycles you know these patterns right well i think i think it goes further i i've been putting out the idea for many years that if you look at certain phenomena or reported phenomena in our society it's my hypothesis that there is a group somewhere in the world that has an extremely sophisticated social engineering science that they have kept very secret. Mm -hmm. And the reason I, I think that is that quantum mechanics in physics really did throw a huge philosophical monkey wrench into the works. Because the uncertainty principle says basically you cannot predict the position and momentum of an electron at the same time. So when you decide you're going to measure for one or the other, you are to a certain extent predetermining the outcome of the experiment. It's called the observer effect. Mm -hmm. So can that effect be scaled up? to the macro physical world in other words the world of real life can can the observer effect have an influence on the macro universe and if so what about a group observer several people observing the same thing can that have a group effect i think that they have been running something like a massive macro observer effect experiment for a number of years uh the mandela effect i think is is a phenomenon that people have reported i'm i'm one of the i'm one of the individuals that's experienced it and i have a i have a relatively good memory uh and i can i can assure you that i remember the old white house reporter helen thomas having died during the Clinton administration. And I can remember Bill Clinton eulogizing her. Well, come to find out, no, she didn't. My point is, is that I think the Mandela effect Mm -hmm. is a result of these experiments that have been running, in my opinion, it's a hypothesis, Mm -hmm. that they've been running to see if a deliberate and willful change of a timeline or memory can have a macro physical effect so i think that they've been running a deliberate experiment carefully planting stories in the news in different regions of the world so in other words once it sets in motion once you start playing with the memory of a timeline you are also influencing the future itself and vice versa in other words the universe is becoming porous. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's the only way I can put it. But yeah, if you're doing that, what you're doing is going back to the cycles idea, you are influencing 
the memory of a cycle. You're not changing the cycle, but you are influencing a trend line in a particular way. So this is what they're playing with. And folks, I, I want to emphasize this is a this is an experiment, if I'm correct, with cosmic implications. Uh, if if you can imagine weaponizing this stuff, then yeah, you you get the picture. This is very very dangerous stuff. Now I'm done. <laughs> no, well, all I was going to say was, um, you know, there, in the book you talked about um, how they would do these things as well to keep the system that they're you know that, that has been very good to them from collapsing, right? And and it requires right. them to open the system. And you said one of the things that they could right. use is revolution and i was thinking like yeah. in terms of like woke ideology you know yep. all, all these things you know to kind of create revolutionary yep. things to you know start destabilization in order to open the system you know right well they they can do that but the problem the problem with that kind of revolution uh that kind of revolution i think is an all-out epistemological warfare on reality and the problem is if you collapse reality you end up with nothing you end up with nihilism you end up with you know the big red line in a circle going through everything uh and that's that's where a lot of these people are they are literally nihilists and you know ordo ab cow this is this is the template which they're following the problem is you have to have, if you unleash a revolution like that, you have to have sufficient control over the very institutions that you are undermining in order to halt the revolution at a, at a point when it benefits your power base. My problem with what I'm seeing now is that Mr. Globaloney has radically and massively overestimated his power in the those very institutions he's rolled the dice like hitler invading the soviet union and discovered uh oh the plan went wrong and now my whole logistical operation is a nightmare and i can't sustain this that's where i think mr global owning is that's why i think we're seeing signs of panicked reaction they've lost control and I think the biggest thing that they they the biggest mistake that they made and the thing that is showing that they've lost control is that in the West, Mr. Global Looney is and has not been concerned with any matters of deep culture. Everything for Mr. Global Looney was about technocracy, about the process, and so on and so forth. And he radically underestimated the, the influence of that kind of basically materialistic and secular outlook. And it's not going to play in the rest of the world. And in fact, it's not even playing in the West. Yeah. So in other words, I think they I think they rolled the dice and, and they've lost control of the narrative. Now they have to get control back. So how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do it through a counter-revolution. So, you know, we're seeing those signs, too. We're seeing the signs of the inevitable backlash. The problem is they've unleashed, in my opinion, Daniel, they've unleashed a kind of worldwide uh, cultural populism that they cannot control because they don't understand it. They don't understand culture. Mr. Global Looney likes modernist art. Mm -hmm. He likes the music of Arnold Schoenberg and not J.S. Bach, you know, yeah. and on and on we could go. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, you know, that's Chaos what, K, yeah, that's what they are, you know, and they can't understand why anybody doesn't think that all of this is just wonderful. Well, you know, I'm one of those that thinks, no, none of this is just wonderful. Uh, 
I'd rather go look at a Gothic cathedral than the Obama presidential library. One is an architectural masterpiece and the other is a mess, you know. <laughs> well, on, one, on, one of the things, too, I mean, that brings us back to order. And instead yes. of chaos, you have order. And so you have the, the music of the spheres. And this is going to, I'm going to use that to take us back to, uh, right. you mentioned a guy named Ray Tomes, and he had a paper toward a unified theory of cycles. And he talked about mm -hmm. solar activity. And now the mm -hmm. music of the spheres, we're talking, Pythagoras is talking about, you know, as above, so below. So you're looking at cycles that are happening on the earth. And so a materialist would look at solar cycles and, um, you know, notice, hey, you know, and, and you said it's, it's a very shallow way of, of looking at things. But say, for instance, solar, the solar activity is less. So we have, you know, smaller crop yields, and this is going to affect the, the economy across the, you know, across the board. Um, right. but, but there's different kind of influences um that you know these these wider arcs these wider cycles have on the earth and i wanted to kind of jump off you know get your thoughts on that you know like astrology how the, you know whatever what, what we call astrology how that fits into modern kind of cycle theory all right well you mentioned the music of the spheres so so let's go back to what i said earlier that that Imagine you have an extremely sophisticated science of cycles that would include uh, the social and cultural component as, as a part of that science. And if you look at a cycle, if you look at the waveform of a cycle, once, once you say that it's a waveform, you're, you're in the realm of music. You're in the realm of harmonics. Yep. And since you mentioned Pythagoras, let's go there. Because this is where it gets really interesting. I play the pipe organ. That's the instrument that I grew up with. Yeah, uh, It's the instrument I wanted to learn how to play. So that's the instrument I learned to play. Well, if you play the pipe organ, you are in an absolutely unique position amongst all musicians. Because you're, you know, if you sit down at, at the console of a pipe organ, you've got all of these knobs on the stop jam. And if you look at the knobs on the stop jam, they have numbers on them. Eight, four, 16, 32, one and three fifths, two and two thirds. You know, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, those numbers are based on the harmonic series. Okay. And this is where Pythagoras comes in. Because in the harmonic series, every overtone that occurs from a fundamental occurs in a decreasing ratio of intervals. So in other words, if you sit at an acoustic piano and you press the note C silently, and then you hit the same note C an octave below it, what are you going to hear? Well, you're going to hear the note that you hit. But you're also going to hear the open string of that silently pressed C vibrating sympathetically with it. So that's the first overtone. It's the octave. The next different overtone above that is if you press down silently the note G and then hit the C. If you press down the fifth, notice that the interval just got smaller, you're going to hear that silent G vibrating sympathetically with the C. Mm -hmm. The next different interval is going to be the fourth. And then the one after that will be the third. You're going to hear the note E. So all those numbers on the organ console are basically those overtones of the harmonic series that that stop is designed to emphasize. So you're literally, when you sit at a, a pipe organ console, you're sitting at the console of an analog synthesizer that's nothing but a wave mixer. You're playing yeah, it, with the waves. It's, now here it's, comes go ahead. here. Okay, here comes the catch. Pythagoras noted he was the first one in recorded history. I doubt he was the first one in history mm -hmm. to notice that as you proceed up the harmonic series, you come to an interval. And for those who want to know where to find this information, go listen to the very first lecture of Leonard Bernstein at Harvard University called The Unanswered Question. He demonstrates what I'm talking about at the piano keyboard. And you come to an interview, an interval 
that you cannot reproduce on any keyboard instrument if you're taking the note C as your fundamental. And that is a note that's sandwiched between B flat and A natural. It's right in between. It's in the crack. The blue note. Yeah. It's a blue note. Exactly. That note between the B flat and A natural is a note that occurs naturally in the harmonic series. But if you tune your instrument to that note, you will not be able to change keys between the key that you've tuned the instrument in and any other key. So what happens is our modern Western music is based on a slight mathematical adjustment to that specific overtone in the harmonic series. And as a result of that mathematical adjustment, you don't have to stop and retune the keyboard. In other words, this is all a consequence of having keyboard instruments that you can play any note, any music in any key, and you can change key during the piece of music from one key to another. Now, if you doubt what I'm saying, go and listen to Hindu music. You will very quickly be bored because it stays in the same key for 40, 50 plus minutes. It never changes because it has not made that mathematical adjustment. Now, here's the point. If you are looking at this from the eyes or point of view of a physicist or mathematician, let's say you're an Isaac Newton or you're a Pythagoras, the universe has presented you a mystery. And it's told you that with but a slight mathematical adjustment, you can have a, an instrument that is harmonically resonant to every possible key. But you have to find the mathematical interval to do that. So the first unification of physics, Daniel, the very first unification is music and that harmonic interval that changes that overtone just slightly. That's the first unification in, in all of physics. It's not electricity and magnetism. In other words, it's not James Clark Maxwell. Mm -hmm. It's Pythagoras. The fact that we call it the periodic table, you said it was the first science. The fact we call it the periodic table came from a, an Englishman named John Newland. And before Mendeleev, he created this chart, which he, he, he saw uh, atoms, what we call atoms, as waves in the ether, as musical notes, basically. And he said mm -hmm. that he noticed that if you go up an octave, you know, mm -hmm. um, you'll get basically the same element, but at a higher octave, a higher vibrational frequency. And now we seem to be going back to that. We, the Newland, it, 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 like the, the, our understanding of atoms was completely wrong. And now we're going, like Michio Kaku uh, recently said that, he said that we're going back to Pythagoras, you know, with these these fractal patterns and stuff. But I wanted mm -hmm. to, to hit something uh, just real quick. There's a guy named John Searle. Have you ever heard of this? heard of the Searle generator? Yes. Um, I, I wanted to play a clip for you just really quickly. Um, I'm going to hit share screen. They want to, uh, to see the disc fly, I think, uh, 69 to 71. The German TV uh, sent a, a report in color, and there was shown a, a flyable disc. It was hovering in the, the top of the trees, I think 25 meters. The electron flow is accelerated to an extremely high rate and it creates a vacuum around the device. And in that vacuum, you develop numbing cold. And numbing cold, as we know today, is a function of superconductivity. It also, which is, has not been known, a function of gravitational force. The Searle effect is developed from the law of the squares. And it is from these squares that John Searle developed his generator and flying disks. But it didn't stop there. Over the course of his lifetime, John Searle's understanding of the squares would be used by him to explain all aspects of life in the universe. From DNA to relativity, from single-celled life to the human being, from transportation to construction of buildings, the squares could be used to understand everything. When I took up my training as an apprentice electrical engineer, 
But the third day, I presented a docket to take to the stores, and I saw this tube with a small tube buff. I asked the foreman what that meant. He said, that's two squares. So I said, well, what is two squares? So he draws two by two, tell me four squares, four. And I said to him, it doesn't make sense to me. What on earth do we have empty squares for? If it's a square, there must be some value there. But you can take a square, if you run the numbers in normal, one, two, three, four, five, six, that is uniform in. But when you toke them up, each row, each column, each diagonal, you'll find they add up different. Putting numbers in random, we come up with a uniform output. Every line, every column, the two diagonals come up precisely the same. Random numbers in squares will produce a uniform total. John Searle would soon call this the law of the squares, nature's way of achieving order from chaos. From those numbers, John Searle had the exact amount of each ingredient in the rollers and rings of his generator. Now, every one square represents a quantity of a material, and that's very important. This is precisely how I developed the SEG. So I copy nature in every way. I work at trying to think how nature's doing it. Okay, now the reason why I played that was because he essentially was saying that when you do the Pythagorean, these squares, right? You put random mm -hmm. numbers in and it, nature will create homeostasis. And he said, when, when I create a, a generator, he was creating a dynamo, but what, what he was making, the dynamo itself was not revolutionary at all, right? But if you use the same specs that are in the squares, you use the same ratios, the Pythagorean ratios, then all of a sudden it will be in, a, in, a, in alignment with nature, right? So, so for instance, if, if there's a four, then you make, you know, the, the housing four millimeters thick. Okay. Well, what's the next number in the, you know, the random number generator? Okay. 13. Okay. So now we're going to make the next element, you know, uh, 13 millimeters thick. And then we make the next element. If there's a seven in square, it's seven. You know, so he conformed to this kind of mm -hmm. Pythagorean model and it brings it into alignment with the universe. And when that happens, according to the, the theory, let's, you know, let's just posit that it he, it might not be a hoax um but he but basically when when everything is in alignment with nature's kind of specs then all of a sudden there's less friction and it goes down when the machine is operating it goes down to like four kelvin you know which is almost like mm -hmm. absolute zero or whatever mm -hmm. and um and all of a sudden this, there's this gravitational effect and it starts to lift up you know mm -hmm. he didn't want it to lift up it just all of a sudden it did it, it, it was mm -hmm. affecting the gravity around it and it reminded me a lot of what you are an expert in the nazi bell that all of a sudden you have this this m machine with plasma spinning and all of a sudden it has mm -hmm. you know the ability to to fly and do all these other things it reminded me very much of of what they were talking about with the nazi bell so well yeah there is if if you credit all of these stories with any reality and i do uh in searle's case uh there were a number of people connected with it that to me, it just doesn't make sense that these people are all in on a hoax and agreeing to say that, yeah, we saw these things, you know, lift off the ground. Um, the problem is all of these things seem to have certain phenomena or certain conceptual things in common. Rotation being one of the principal components and, and a high degree of either electrical or mechanical, and in some cases, both types of rotation. Um, in some cases, these, you know, Searle generators, uh, magnetic monopole machines, you know, all of this different stuff, uh, even, even Tesla's uh, impulse magnifying transmitter coils, all of these things at some point involve, to my to my way of looking at it, some sort of differential rotation. In other words, you've got the sun up there and it's a big ball of of plasma and the plasma is rotating uh, in each hemisphere of the sun, but there's a differential rotation in that plasma as it's rotating. The nearer the equator, it's rotating faster. The 
closer to the poles, it's rotating slower. Um, the other problem that all of these strange on the fringe stories seem to have, and, and I'm including all of it again, Searle, uh, Faraday monopoles, uh, Brian De Palma, uh, brother of the famous movie producer. He did some experiments with rotating systems. Um, Thomas Townsend Brown, you know, all of the stuff that, that we've read stories about on the fringes of physics, Philadelphia experiment, you know, all of it. They also all seem to have at some point, particularly when you dig into or attempt to, to dig into the conceptual justifications for these things, they all have at some point a reliance on harmonics and we're back to Pythagoras again. There's something harmonic about all of it. You know, to me, I, I got my start, Daniel, in all of this with the Great Pyramid because when you look at the dimensional the dimensional measures of the structure, regardless of what system of measure you look at it in, but when you look at the the dimensional measures of the structure, you're seeing how you know I can I'm a pipe organist. When I sit down at a pipe organ console, I can tell I'm looking at an instrument that is absolutely requiring you to think in terms of harmonic series. Well, I look at the Great Pyramid the same way. I see all of these numbers popping out that tell uh, is telling me that whoever designed this thing, they were designing it like a gigantic, huge pipe organ. It's a huge mechanical acoustic harmonic series oscillator. Mm -hmm. But it appears to me that it's doing more than that. It's It's oscillating the entire harmonic series, optical, acoustic, you name it. So this is the other thing that all of these things have in common. I do not think, and I think Kaku is absolutely correct, uh, If and it comes out if you read his book. Uh, where is it? Yeah, his book, his textbook, Introduction to String and M Theory. I mean, <laughs> you want some crazy harmonic mathematics. Uh, that book is just full of it. Um, you, you're dealing with a kind of um, science that I think once existed on this planet eons ago, and it was much more sophisticated than anything we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just, uh, in, in all honesty, I look at things like the Searle generator that, that you've shown on on the screen share and uh, these other things i think these are we're just on the cusp of these things i think searle is on to something and the reason why is that if you look at a at, at a soviet fellow by the name of yevgeny podkletnov i don't know if you've heard of him mm. But Podkletnov noticed the same exact thing as Searle when he was playing around with some superconducting disks at near absolute zero temperature. He began to notice things had a tendency to start to levitate. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, you know, you've got, a, and as far as I know, Podkletnov at the time that he made his discovery had never even heard of Searle and vice versa. So in other words, you do have these little indicators if you if you're paying attention that something is going on in physics and it's being carefully kept off of the public eye. We are constantly being directed to the problem between relativity and quantum mechanics, and don't ask any more questions, please. Um, you know. <laughs> And on and on it goes. I mean, people can't even get, uh, I noticed in your screen share, the, the equation E equals MC squared, and it was written capital E equals capital M capital C squared. That's incorrect. The correct form of Einstein's equation, most people, most people get it wrong. It's capital E 
equals capital M, that's very important, mm -hmm. little c squared. Why is the capital M important? Because if you look at special relativity, Einstein is using capital, he's performed a mathematician's trick because the expression that M substitutes for is mass one minus mass two. So in other words, the capital M represents a mass differential. Mm -hmm. That's key. So it's not just That's, mass as a concept. It's not just mass. Yeah. It's a mass difference. Yeah. Okay. That's key. So when you write the equation from now on, folks, please use a capital M. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to, okay. So we're talking about, we went to quantum mechanics and, and kind of, tiny particles and john newland by the way just to get yep. back to him with uh seeing atoms as waves in the ether yep. and how how he basically said why does certain kind of atoms go together and certain don't certain atoms do not go and he said it was because of harmonics you know the yeah. octave uh, like atoms that are you know different octaves they, they'll go together but anyway so we're talking about small particles but those same laws when you talk about quantum mechanics and relativity there's that famous oh well they don't go together they don't work however when you go to pythagorean physics they yep. do go together yeah as they above, go so below and so those same things those same kind of harmonics that happen at the subatomic level are actually happening at the planetary level and now we get back to astrology and these cycles and so yep. there was a, a physicist a friend of mine named jenny sent me this video of this uh i can't remember i think he was from korea and he noticed that every time that the planets were in certain alignments, that it would actually trigger uh, solar activity that affected the Earth. Like even I, I did the audiobook for Principles of Geology uh, by Charles Lyell in 1830. And even then in 1830, they understood that there was a, a, an electric current through the center of the Earth. And this, yes. this electric current was being stimulated by solar activity and yes. it would set off magma. It would melt rock. It would, it would affect the climate and everything of the planet. And so- I wanted you to, to touch on that because in your book you mentioned that that, that every well, time two it, planets are at different 180 degree angles and a 90 degree angle suddenly. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Tesla said it uh, with his trial over the over the Wardenclyffe wireless power transmission thing. He was sued for recovery of funds that investors had invested in. Mm. And you can read the trial transcript of that trial. I think it was 1915 that it occurred. And during a period of the trial, when Tesla himself is on the stand, he's talking about the tower that he had built there at Wardenclyffe and the fact that he had to sink iron and steel pilings deep into the earth. And the attorney asked him, why did you do that? And his answer was, because it was necessary to get a grip on the earth in order for this system to work. Well, if you look at what Tesla is doing, and I, I agree with the engineer Eric Dollar, that all Tesla did, the only thing that he did in his wireless power transmission scheme, is he simply turned the broadcast circuit upside down. So in other words, the earth becomes the antenna and the atmosphere becomes the ground return in the circuit. That's all he did. Um, that's, quite a, that's quite a whopper because it means, as he also pointed out, that he's playing around with standing surface waves on the entire planet. <laughs> you know, uh, so... Voila, all of a sudden we're engineering a system of planetary scale. Well, once you start saying that, then you're at the very next stage. Because that means that the solar system itself is an electrodynamic system. So, in my thinking, this is the reason why when you have a new nuclear power that joins the club, they start testing like crazy because they've made an interesting discovery that the yields of their devices will vary with time. So in other words, say you've got your A-bomb. You've just made your first A-bomb in your garage, and you've got your little plutonium core, and you've got a certain amount of C4 packed around your plutonium core, and you take it out into the country to detonate your little plutonium A-bomb, 
and you've designed two of them, and the first time you set it off, oh, you get a yield of a couple hundred kilotons, and the next time you set it off, you get a yield of 230 kilotons, and it's the same design. So why the difference in yield? Well, it's very simple. That bomb, for a moment, creates a plasma. That plasma, in turn, is an electromagnetic phenomenon existing inside of a much bigger circuit, and therefore, depending on the circumstances of the circuit at the time you detonate your bomb, that, that detonation is going to gate now more and now less energy into the reaction simply from the circumstances in which it's detonated. So, in other words, the bomb yield will change. And once you've made that discovery, you're thinking, oh, my word, all of this is resonant to everything else. We can conceivably and theoretically affect the entire cosmos with these things. That's what I think has happened. Uh, you that's why I think you, you start seeing UFO phenomenon right about the times that the first explosions, atomic explosions occur, which, by the way, is 1944. Interesting. <laughs> As opposed to 40, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask... Um, because this gets into woo woo. Now we're going. Into oh, woo -woo. we're 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 way gone into well, woo woo. By the, now. Even even worse. Uh, so so there, there's the crypto terrestrial theory uh, that yes. you know what we what we we've, we've been led to believe are aliens out there are actually things that might be living either interdimensionally or under the earth. Charles Lyell, by the way, uh, the guy who wrote Principles of Geology in 1830, he said the perfect geologist would be some subterranean creature that lived under the earth because it would see the processes better than we do who are on the surface. Sure. And so now imagine this, imagine if we start like Tesla, you asked in the thing, why, why was that shut down? And we still haven't fully returned to that technology. And I, I actually pitched this idea, by the way, I want, I want you to know that. And I used Tesla and a bunch of other people saying, why don't we use the earth as a cell tower, right? You wouldn't have any <laughs> line of sight interference, you know, like use earth resonant frequencies. And now here's the thing, and it was stopped, it was shut down. And you asked, it has to be more than just me the metering issue that, that you know, kind right. of the, the oligarchs were worried about. Um, right. Something else was in play. And my question, this is it gets into woo-woo. Imagine if there is something that lives underground, something that lives subterranean, you know, in a subterranean fact, fact, they would suddenly be very concerned if we were setting off nukes or if we were shooting like electrical kind of signals through the earth. Now, let me repeat what Charles Lyell said in the 1830s that the earth has has a an electric current and that electric current stimulates magma that magma mm -hmm. melts rocks those rocks that are melted release gases like sulfur carbon methane all these things if it can't you know get escape then you get earthquakes you get vesuvius you get things that the explosions uh you also get from the 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 gases that are released you get climate alterations that happen. Um, and so now imagine if it wasn't just the earth or excuse me, the sun that was affecting these cycles, but imagine if we started affecting those cycles. So we think, oh, look, this is great. Look, we have a worldwide internet, but you're going to be affecting and stimulating those systems down there well, that we're not aware of, but whatever lives down there I, is aware of it. I, I get the question and I can, I, we, we don't even have to make it that complex. Tesla himself let the the genie out of the bag after the initial project was shut down with several articles in the New York Times when he said, I can set the entire earth to quiver mm -hmm. and cause earthquakes of miles in oscillation. And in fact, if it's not damped, I can crack the planet in two. So in other words, this is, and, and I think this is why it was shut down because the, the technology implies quite literally a planet destroying capability. Now, since it is something that you're playing around with on the entire planet, Imagine if you set up some sort of magnetic resonance with a system like that and the sun. 
Mm -hmm. And then, since you're at it, if you can establish that kind of resonance effect, why not go for the whole ball of wax and set up some sort of resonance effect with the galaxy? Now we're back to astrology. And we're back, we're back to the whole nine yards. By the way, new book out that you might want to check. The Demon and the Ecker. The Demon and the Ecker. Angels, Demons, Plasmas, Patristics, and Pyramids. That is the whole, I will read that and I, I will have you back on. But before, because that hits everything. Warden Cliff reminded me uh, yeah. of the Pyramids too. Have to get <laughs> to the Earth. But okay, now here's the thing. Um, it, we're about to come into an alignment that is very similar to the alignment that happened in 79 AD when Vesuvius went off. And yeah. I wanted, I wanted to play you a video just really quickly. And it's kind of, it kind of wraps this all up. This one gentleman is talking about a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. Let me hit the video. Bear with me. And I am going to bring you back here to the tree of life, the Kabbalah for those who understand uh, more ancient mysticism, this alignment is October 24th and October 23rd of 2024. Now, it seems to me there was an encoded message in the tree of life, that somehow this tree of life understood and pointed to dates and signs in the heavens, and there shall be signs, that when we reach this square, somehow electromagnetism is funneled through, expedited, something happens electromagnetically with these planets in the one quadrant of the solar system. As the Earth passes through from the sun's magnetic field through that, some sort of speediness, some sort of anomaly. You know, you've seen uh, people going down chutes. What's that? Ice racing, uh, you know, any, any kind of chutes, water slides. You can, like a million ways that you can see something funneled. What well, seems like these two parallel planet sets are sending electromagnetism and behaving in such a different and unusual way for this period of time. Now, the last time, interestingly, that this formation was as square as it is 79 AD. That was barely after the formation of Christianity or even during the time. I mean, it took until what? 300 AD approximately for Christianity to be formed in its what you consider form right now. But during that time, 79 AD, you know, everybody talks about Vesuvius and things, but there was a lot more going on at the change of an age at that point also. Move from Taurus to Bull into Pisces. And now we're moving out of Pisces just these last two years, three years, in 2020, three years, into the age of Aquarius. Now, it's really very quirky that you're looking at signs in the heavens, and these brokers of power always are looking at the energetics of our solar system and where the stars sit. And we move from an age from Taurus to Bull into Christ, the fish. And now we're out of that. In the same place that it was formed, it's almost like it's being destroyed to mark the end of the age and the beginning of a new. I do want to point out one thing. On the seventh, when this thing kicked off, the Earth, this is a geocentric view here. So looking from the Earth out, we are in the max apex of the magnetic field as it's forming to its maximum anomaly in 2024. We passed through that maximum anomaly for this year, the day that this war kicked off on the seventh. Now, you cannot tell me that's a coincidence. I really will refuse to believe that. Okay, and that gets us back to where we started, mm -hmm. the war in Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the set. <laughs> well, look, I earlier, I, I when we were talking about the deeper layers, the other layer that, that I was going to mention that, I, that we kind of got chasing some other rabbit holes, but the other layer is, yes, this, this esoteric and occult layer. Um, I do think that a lot of these operations by Mr. Global Lonely are deliberately planned to coincide with certain uh, with certain dates and with certain astrological alignments and so on, which they then use, as did this gentleman, to spin into a kind of a narrative. Uh, about the end of one religious age and the beginning of another. Um, I think that's entirely possible to a degree. Um, 
the part where the part where I part company with him is this idea that Christianity was not fully formed at birth, that it takes to the year 300 AD or so. And I think I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the the emergence of the church as a hierarchical structure. The Council of Nicaea. Right. But bad news, folks, that's baloney. You can go read the epistles of St. Ignatius, personal disciple of the apostle St. John. And if you read those epistles, you're going to discover, number one, it was hierarchical from the get-go. Number two, it was sacramental and ritualistic from the get-go. There has never been any other kind of Christianity. The idea that the early church is this modern American, hang up your shingle and just start preaching, that's, (laughs) again, uh, it's coming out of Judaism, folks, and you don't get much more ritualistic and hierarchical than that. So, you know, this idea that Constantine started something at in 325 AD, or that he took books out of the Bible, this is nonsense, folks. Get over it. Do the hard work. Go read real theology. Go read the Church Fathers. Yeah, Don't nobody's really, going to do that, Joseph. You have to I, do that I, for us. That's why we have. <laughs> well, no, the problem. People are the lazy. Is, no, the, the problem is people are lazy at the very time in history where it might be a good idea to start learning some of these things because they are certainly going to play a big factor. And, you know, you can't be reliant on hacks from South Dakota, you know. Uh, well, I, I'm just worried about if, like, 79 AD, if there is actually solar activity, <laughs> well, what if Yellowstone blows? Blows. What if Yellowstone yeah, you know, explodes? It, it's kabooey, you know. Um, who knows? <laughs> you we'll know, see. there's there's a reason I'm no longer living in South Dakota. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Well, Joseph, okay. Um, can you tell people the best way to find your work? You mean my books? Your your um, your, your Giza Death Star. Oh, uh, Twitter, the website. Tw- yeah. The well, I don't I don't tweet. Um, I have a website that I blog on. Um, that's called Giza Death Star. G I Z A and then Death Star, all one word. Um, I do my blogs there, and all my books are there on the website. So if they want to check out my books, just. Uh, click the tab that says about or says books and all my books will pop up and you can order them right off the website. Okay. Well, well, Joseph, thank you so much. I'm going to end it here. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for watching. If you'd like to stay updated, hit the like and subscribe buttons. But more importantly, if you don't want to see me reduced to shelling my old merch, such as the Daniel Natal in action figure, where you can see Daniel engaging in an action as he watches TV or engaging in an action as he surfs the internet or failed products like the Daniel Natal Pez Dispenser, or the even more considered Daniel Natal Urinal Cake. Think about supporting the show by buying one of my books. For instance, you can buy my book, Actionable Ethics. The link is in the description below.